Okay, let's start. So in the last class, we uh, looked at quantization noise and how we can estimate the performance of an ADC. So let's do a quick recap. So if you recollect, quantization, uh, the process of quantization, although it is non-linear, we kind of approximated it as though we are adding some error to the signal and getting the quantized output. And we made a few assumptions about the quantization noise. First is the fact that it is a random signal. And what did we assume for its uh, PDF? It was a uniform PDF. And then we also assume that it has a wide power spectral density. And we also saw that these uh, assumptions are valid as long as we have what are called uh, BC signals. That is if the input spans the entire range of the quantizer and there is sufficient variation from sample to sample, these assumptions are uh, valid well in practice. And from the uniform PDF, we kind of calculated the quantization noise power. How much was it? Oops. Yeah, delta square by 12. So this was delta square by 12 and then for a sinusoidal signal, we found out the maximum attainable signal to quantization noise ratio. How much was that in dB? It's 6n plus 1.76 where n is the number of bits to which you are trying to resolve. Yeah, yeah. And then we also remarked that Although this is the maximum achievable signal to quantization noise ratio, in practice you will be able to get something lower. So we calculate the effective number of bits that is back calculated from the signal to noise ratio as 1.76, so many bits. And to uh, measure this SQNR, we will have to apply a sinusoidal signal to our ADC and we get a quantized sinusoid and then we have to find the signal power and noise power separately. This we found, found was not possible to do in time domain. So we resorted to frequency domain and there we had to plot the power spectral density and that is computed as magnitude squared of the Fourier transform. You take multiple averages of it to reduce the variance in the estimate. So that I will denote as expectation and divided by the number of points you have captured. Great. But although this is fine, we saw that there was some practical difficulties in computing this uh, discrete time Fourier transform, which are the following. So if I were to write the expression, so it is going to look like this, summation n equal to 0 to infinity, so e plus g omega. So here there are uh, two things. First is the fact that the frequency variable omega is continuous. Now although omega is periodic in 2 pi, in any given interval of 2 pi, we have to compute the Fourier transform for all possible values. And the second is the fact that this uh, summation is running from 0 to infinite. And to solve this, at least to solve the first problem of the frequency variable omega being continuous, what did we do? We kind of computed the Fourier transform at discrete frequency points like this and if we were to take n frequency points, what are the values of omega at which we compute the Fourier transform at? Yeah, so k goes from 0 to n minus 1, right? Great. And to solve the issue of this upper limit running to infinite, infinity, what did we do? We recorded the input sequence and truncated it for a finite number of samples and that can be some 0 to a record length nr minus 1. And what do we choose for nr and n? How do we choose them? We choose them to be equal and this gives rise to the discrete Fourier transform. Okay. So basically the discrete Fourier transform can be thought of as taking an input sequence x of n 
truncating it to a finite length of n samples and this process of truncation can be thought of as multiplying x of n with a rectangular window where this rectangular window has basically n ones from 0 to n minus 1 and all the other samples are 0. And for this truncated sequence you find the discrete time Fourier transform and this is computed at k times 2 pi by n. Now when we found this discrete Fourier transform and then reconstructed the signal back x of n back, what did we find in the reconstructed sequence? It was periodic, right? Again, sampling happening in one domain will result in some kind of periodicity in the other dual domain. Okay. So here also, when I reconstruct the sequence back, I saw there was some periodicity. So which means if I have some discrete time sequence like this, again, uh, I'm just drawing like a continuous signal for simplicity. So say 0 to n minus 1. And I take an endpoint DFT and reconstruct the sequence back you will find that the sequence is sort of periodic like this. Okay. So the other way to interpret a discrete Fourier transform is that you take a data set which is comprised which comprises of n samples, you assume that it is repeated on either sides to form a periodic sequence and then we are computing the spectrum of that periodic signal. right? And in this case what is the periodicity of the sequence? n we are assume i mean it repeats after n samples so it's a periodic signal with a period of n samples so what is the fundamental frequency a discrete time sequence period of uh, n samples what is the fundamental frequency 2 pi by n right and centuries ago fourier told us that if we have a periodic sequence or a signal with a fundamental frequency 2 pi by n in its frequency spectrum what are the frequency components you will observe? If you have a periodic signal, what are the frequency components you will observe in its spectrum? You will find only the harmonics of its fundamental frequency, right? And this is basically the fundamental frequency. So if you take the spectrum of this periodic signal, you will find only its harmonics, which is k2 pi by n. I mean, that's basically the same thing, right? It is just that you know you can interpret the same thing in multiple ways. Okay. Right. So, so which means instead of computing the power spectral density uh, using the DTFT like this magnitude Fourier transform square. Now the variable is no longer omega; it is k. So I'll find the power spectral density like this. So it's one by n expected value of mod v of k square right? and with the uh, discrete time Fourier transform how do I compute the power in the signal from the power spectral density you have to integrate it and remember there is also a scaling factor of 1 by 2 pi because you are dealing with this radiant frequency right so let's say it's 0 to 2 pi SPV of e power g omega and here I have written the limit going from 0 to 2 pi which means this is one sided PSD or a two sided PSD huh? it is two sided see for one sided it is from 0 to pi so this is spanning the entire range of 2 pi so this is inherently assumed to be a two sided PSD okay. so which means here I will compute the power like this so we can rewrite from this so it is 1 by 2 pi integration becomes summation in the variable k and svv of k and d omega is 2 pi by n so 2 pi 2 pi cancels so we can basically rewrite it as 1 by n so we basically sum up the power spectral density and scale it by the number of points that gives the power okay so now for your adc output if i were to find the power spectral density in omega it would have looked like this this is omega axis say this is spb of e power g omega i am looking at single sided psds from 0 to pi so we are giving a sinusoidal signal as the test signal so it will 
show show up in the spectrum as an impulse and the quantization noise will have a flat pass spectral density like this and in practice when we measure it using the discrete fourier transform so the x axis is k so here it is svb of k and here i have taken the omega x omega to go from 0 to pi so what will be the range for k 0 to n by 2 okay okay remember 2 pi maps to n pi maps to n by 2 so here we expect that the sinusoid should show pass an impulse like this and all the other bins will be filled by the quantization noise and to find the uh, signal to quantization noise ratio first you find the signal power and let us say the signal is lying on an mth bin you just take the strength of that bin scale it by n that gives the signal power fine and to find the noise power you scale you sum up all the other bins I'll just say k not equal to m, and again divide it by n. And in practice, I mean, since you are taking the ratio, the scaling factor will not make a lot of difference. So that's why, loosely speaking, people will just say that the strength of this bin will give the signal power, and some of all the other bins will give the noise power. But if you want to find the absolute power, you'll have to take care of the scaling factor. As long as you are interested in relative quantities, it's okay. great so this is what we expect that when we take a discrete fourier transform the spectrum will look like so let's see if uh, this is indeed the case or or the, are there any catches so we'll look at what happens when we take dft for both our test signal which is a sinusoid and for the quantization noise right so let us say i have a sinusoid say 2 pi f int I sample at fs. What is the discrete time sequence I'll get? Cos of 2 pi. Yeah. F in by fs times n. Okay. So I can I'll just write it as oops, what's happening. I'll write it as cos of omega not n. basically omega not is 2 pi times f in by fs fine and remember i am taking an end point dft i'll assume that i am taking an end point dft so which means i am truncating the sinusoid for n samples and then taking the dtft computing it at k times 2 pi by n so i can think of it as cos omega not n getting multiplied by a rectangular window and will take its dtft right so let's say this is the cos signal again these are all discrete time sequences this is the rectangular window so we are, uh, we, are we need to find the discrete time fourier transform of this product signal so let's see what is the spectrum of these two guys individually so what will be the spectrum of this cos signal we'll have two impulses in omega axis so one will be at minus omega not plus omega not okay and what will be the spectrum of this rectangular window sync i mean uh, this is in this in discrete time the sync is slightly different but yeah the shape looks similar so we'll have something like this and what will be the nulls what are the frequencies where we have the nulls huh? i mean how we can intuitively say this i mean just by inspection can you say Two pi by n or pi by n? <laughs> okay. See, let's find out. Right. See, basically we are computing the Fourier transform, 
when you are computing fourier transform what you are essentially doing is taking the signal multiplying with sinusoids of different frequencies and taking the average not the average area of the curve integration right so here the sequence is 1 for n samples and then zero afterwards so which means if i multiply this with multiple sinusoids i'll be looking at sinusoids with total duration of n samples and if i integrate that or take the sum of those samples over n it should become zero so what will be the frequencies that will result in this basically what i'm saying is i'll have sinusoids again discrete time and within n samples if i take sinusoids of different frequencies and sum it up i am interested in those frequencies which will result in zero right so what will be the uh, smallest sinusoidal frequency that will do this i mean when will if, i mean if i am integrating a sinusoid let's say this is a sinusoid right so if i integrate till what time i will be getting zero i will have to finish one period at least okay so in n samples it has to complete one cycle so what is the minimum frequency 2 by by n of course you can have integer multiples also right so this so these frequencies are now what 2 by by n is that clear i mean this way you don't have to actually remember just look and say right so in time domain the signals multiply and so frequency domain we have convolution so after convolution what will happen what will be the resultant spectrum the sink will shift to minus omega not plus omega not for simplicity i'll show only the positive side so we'll have omega not something like this and this frequency will be omega not plus 2 pi by n this is omega not minus 2 pi by n and remember omega not itself is 2 pi f in by fs okay so let me uh, draw the spectrum in a separate page so i'll blow it up and show like this so let's say it's omega not so let's say this is omega not plus 2 pi by n this is omega not so it sink is going to look like this okay let's not say this is zero and this is something like this okay so now i can essentially have two possibilities where one is where omega not is of the form 2 pi times m by n where n is the number of points you are taking the dft for and m is some other integer and remember this is the dtft and i'm going to take samples of this dtft at k2 pi by n right so if i take samples at k2 pi by n so okay let's first write it out omega not is 2 pi times m by n so what is this frequency m plus 1 2 pi by n so this will be okay and this will all be other integer multiples of 2 pi by n and remember i am going to sample the spectrum at integer multiples of 2 pi by n so what are the points i will be sampling i mean in this region what is the sample i will take m2 pi by n right so i will be sampling essentially the peak here what will be the next sample m plus 1 2 pi by n so i will be sampling these guys so if i plot the discrete fourier transform i will essentially have a non zero value at the mth bin and all the other bins will be zero okay similarly you will have one at the negative side and if i look at the k values in positive from 0 to n where will be the negative peak appear
I mean you understand it, I will have a negative frequency also. If I span k from 0 to n minus 1, this negative frequency, where will it appear in k axis? Hmm? Okay. No, it's see. Ideally, you will have one more uh, peak at minus two pi by m times n, right? Sorry, minus two pi by n times m. So I'm asking if I I'm looking at k spanning from zero to n minus one. So I'll have one peak corresponding to m. That's a positive frequency. Where will be the negative uh, thing? Okay, let's look at. I mean, see this this frequency. Is same as two plus two pi, fine. So if I simplified, what do I get? So in which bin it will lie now? N minus m, fine. So we'll have one more peak at n minus m, and all the others will be zero. And this is exactly what you also want, and this will happen if you choose your input frequency to be of this form. And this is often <coughs> called as a signal lying on a bin. For obvious reasons. Okay. And if I were to choose this, remember my omega naught in terms of my input and sampling frequency, what was it? 2 pi f in by fs. Okay. Plus okay. So this means that f in by f s, how should it look like right here? What is f in by f s? M by n. Okay. So you have to choose your input frequency to be of the form m by n times f s, where n is the number of DFT points and m is some integer. Of course, uh, later we'll see. Uh, if this is not followed, then there will be multiple things. We'll look at it now. Yeah, next we'll look at it. So this is the condition we have got so far and uh, later we will see a more stricter condition on this. But as of now this is what should be followed. Okay. So let us look at an example. So here I have taken a sinusoid which is of the form 2 pi 201 by 1024n and I am taking a 1024 point DFT. So the axis, this is k axis starting from 0 to this is 1023. And you basically see two peaks, one at 201, and where is this at? n minus m as expected. Okay. Great. So now we can have another possibility for omega naught where I don't satisfy this condition. Okay, so let us see what will happen in that case. I will probably copy paste this. second so here let us say i have chosen omega naught to be uh, 2 pi by 1024 times 201.1 okay so omega naught is basically 201.1 times 2 pi by 1024 so what is this frequency second frequency let me write it clearly hold on What is the second frequency? Two zero two point one. This is basically two hundred point one times two pi by ten twenty four and so on. Right? So I am still going to take samples of this Fourier transform at two pi by ten twenty four. So what are the points I'll be sampling? Will I sample the peak here? No, right? So we'll be Shifting, I mean, we'll be sampling it slightly to the left of it, and the next sample will not be sampled, will not be taken from the notch to the, just to the left of it. Okay, so everywhere we'll be taking some samples like this. So if I show here, something here. Okay, 
So if I plot the discrete Fourier transform, instead of getting only one peak, I'll be basically getting a whole bunch of them, okay, starting from here. Sorry, uh, this the I mean notch corresponds to to not two hundred point one, right? You have to take a two hundred. No, no, we are taking sample set multiple integer multiples of two pi by thousand twenty four. This guy, oops, the notch here corresponds to a frequency of 200.1 by 1024. You have to take the sample at 200 by 1024. That is the left of it. Okay. Is that point clear? Yeah, so this is what will happen. So we'll have uh, something at 201 and it will all spill everywhere. Okay. So if you look at the spectrum, it will have a skirt like this. And this is often called as FFT leakage. And I can show uh, example again. So, yeah. So here I am showing two curves. The yellow one is the one that we already saw, where the signal was lying on a bin. The frequency was chosen appropriately. The blue one is the case where I have chosen the signal so that it doesn't lie on a bin. And you see that there is a huge skirt here, right? Almost like a flat noise, right? Of course, if you don't know anything about DFT, FFT, and you uh, choose an inappropriate frequency for testing your ADC, for all that you know, you might have designed an extraordinary ADC with almost zero noise. But because of the fact that you are unaware of these problems, you might mistake it to be some quantization noise. Okay. So that's why you should clearly understand and give the appropriate input frequency for testing your ADC or in general when you are dealing with FFT or DFT you should be very aware of these things. Okay. So that gives us a strong motivation to choose my input frequency in discrete time to be of the form 2 pi into m by n so that I can translate it to the condition that my input frequency how will I choose m by n times fs where n is the number of points you take for DFT and m is some integer. Okay. Now, of course, in simulation, it's uh, very easy to define it like this. It's all computer. You type in the number, it's going to take it. But in practice, when you are measuring it, for measuring it, for measuring the ADC, how many signal sources do you think we need? Wait, what will? We need two, right? One for generating the input frequency, one for the clock, right? So let's say this is generating Fn and this is generating Fs. Now, if these two are uh, led to operate independently, it can so happen easily that there will be a small drift in the frequency. And remember that I want this ratio to be satisfied. Fn by Fs must be m by n. If you let them operate independently, one of the frequencies can drift to say fn into 1 plus alpha and the other can be fn into some 1 plus beta sorry fs into 1 plus beta so which means your ratio will get screwed so in practice what we do is we sync these two guys that is one will act like a master one will act like a slave so which means if one of the frequency drifts let's say the master's frequency drifts the slave will track it so if one changes to 1 plus alpha, the other will also change by the same factor. So if you take the ratio, you are still having the same thing. Now there is an option in equipments to actually sync. Okay. Great. But in sometimes you might not be able to properly sync it or even if you sync it, there could be some small error. Okay. And let us say because of that, you end up with the frequency. I, let's say I want to choose Fn to be this, but instead, let us say I have something like this. It's a small error, and again, if you if that happens, signal will not lie on a bin. You'll end up with a FFT leakage like this again. Okay. So uh, this is not because you are not you have not chosen your input frequency appropriately. This is simply because of some practical limitations you might have when testing or measuring your ADC. 
So here I am showing actually uh, two cases of FFT leakage. One is where Fn by Fs is 201.1 by 1024. Other is 201.01 by 1024. So which of them do you think is corresponding to this? The green one. Make sense? Right. So the bottom line is of course in uh, measurement you cannot exactly guarantee that the signal lies on a bin. So we will have to find some fix to this problem. right? And again if I stare at the spectrum I do not seem to get any intuition. So frequency domain is failing. So what do we do? You go to time domain and understand what is happening. So for that let us consider the case where the signal was in fact lying on a bin. So I will assume that the frequency is cos 2 pi or I will take the number itself 201 by 1024n. When I am taking the DFT, I am taking the signal for 1024 samples. Okay. So let us say this is the oops, n axis, so 0 to 1023. So I will have signal to be like this. Show different. Again, these are all discrete samples. Remember, I am just drawing it like a continuous signal for simplicity. And for this guy, in 1024 samples, how many cycles the signal will complete? It is 201 by 1024. If I take 1024 samples, it will exactly complete 201 cycles, right? So, oops, I will use the same color. So, it will exactly complete 201 cycles like this. And remember that DFT inherently assumes that you have the signal copy pasted on either sides and forms a periodic sequence and then it finds the Fourier series coefficients of that periodic sequence. Okay. So now if I copy paste this on either sides, because it has exactly completed integer number of cycles, you will have a smoothly continuing sinusoid like this. Okay. So that is why it is looking like a proper sinusoid. If you take its Fourier series, you had what you expect. Now let us consider the case where the signal was not falling on a bin. Let us say it is 201.01 by 1024. So if I do the same thing starting from 0 to 1023. So in 1023 samples how many cycles will it complete? Slightly above 201 right. So it will look like this. So it will complete 201 cycle and then slightly start after that, something like this. Okay. So now if I copy paste this guy to form a periodic sequence, at this point you will see a jump. That is at the 1024th sample, let us say this is 1024, there will be a jump. Similarly here there will be a jump. Sorry? Fine. Again, these are all discrete time sequences. I will keep reminding you again and again. Okay. So now you see that we no longer have a smooth sinusoidal signal. Instead, we have sharp discontinuities around the edges. Okay. And this is what is giving rise to our FFT leakage. Right. And I mean, if I were to roughly model this, I can think of this guy as having a smooth sinusoid plus some error signal, right? And the error signal, do you think it is maximum at the middle portions of the waveform or at the edges of the waveform? At the edges, the error is maximum, and around the middle region, the error is almost zero. So, again, we are looking at very crude approximation. So, I will assume that the error is all zero in between and only at the edges it is maximum all the others are zero again very zero order approximation so you will have the error impulses at 0 1024 and so on now this guy if i take the dft there is no issues ideally it's a smooth sinusoid so corresponding to this i'll have nice impulse like this 
Now this guy is a periodic sequence with a period 1024. It's an impulse time in time domain. In frequency domain, what will happen? If you have an impulse train in time domain, in the frequency domain also it is an impulse train. And what is the fundamental frequency of this uh, signal? 2 pi by 1024. So you will have harmonics of this, that's all. So in frequency domain it is an impulse train. So basically you will have something like this. That is why you have the flat portion in the spectrum that you see here. So this flat portion is because of the fact that you have that kind of sudden jumps which can be treated as periodic impulse strain resulting in a flat portion. Okay. So now we have found the problem. The basic problem is the fact that around the edges when we repeat the signal there is an abrupt jump. Okay. So somehow we will have to smoothen that. So I will draw that separately here. So let us say this is the deal and at the edges there is some jump. This is the window I am taking 0 to n minus 1. <coughs> now the this is the signal that we have captured for n samples. Now the information in between has no problems. The co content only around the edges seems to be causing trouble. right? So the solution is to basically weight the signal so that you give more emphasis to the samples in between and you de-emphasize the strength of the samples at the edges. So you can think of it as multiplying by a weighting signal which sort of looks like this. Again this all discrete time sequences. I am lazy to draw it like this so I am drawing like continuous time. So basically you make sure that the signals samples around the edges have very minimal weightage and samples around the middle have the maximum one. So that way even the error signal which was around the edges, the effect of those error signal will also get minimized. Okay. And uh, this act of smoothening out the edges, smoothening out the discontinuities around the edges is called windowing. And there are a whole bunch of these uh, window functions. So we look at a couple of them which we will use in the course as well as uh, you know they are the ones used in practice for simulations and measurement also. So one such window is a hand window. Or raised cosine window. So basically it is uh, using a sinusoidal signal and I want to have something like this, right? Again this is 0 to n minus 1. So it is a cos signal. What is the frequency of the signal? Okay. 2 pi by n. It finishes one cycle in n samples. So it is basically cos 2 pi by n times n. But this cos 2 pi by n does something like this, right? I want the other one. So what should I do? Minus, minus of this. So if I take minus, it will go from basically minus 1 to plus 1. Let's say I want it to go from start from 0. I'll add 1. Let's say I want this to be maximum value must be 1, let us say. Then what should I do? I'll divide it by 2. And this is exactly the hand window. So what we do in practice is we truncate the signal for n samples that is that can be modeled as though I am taking the signal multiplying it with a rectangular window and these n samples are then weighted or multiplied by this smoothing function which is the hand window. So this is then multiplied by the hand window I will say hand n of n. And then you take the DTFT at k2 pi by n. And the expectation is that since we have reduced the 
discontinuities around the edges, the effect of this leakage will also reduce. So let's see if it's indeed the case. So here again, I'm showing the same case where I have chosen the signal to be 201.01 .01 by 1024. So the blue one is the case uh, without any windowing, and this is with hand window. And you clearly see that the moment you smoothen the signal out, the skirt has also reduced a lot. Okay. Great. So, of course, now we have made sure that if the signal is not lying on a bin, things are okay. But let's also make sure that if it was lying on a bin, it should be fine. It shouldn't be like, you know, you try to uh, block a hole in your ship and in the process you introduce two new holes, right? So, we, when we try to solve the problem, we should not create new problems. So, let's see if the signal is lying on a bin, what happens? So, I'll assume my initial X of n to be cos something like this. I will take it for n samples alone. And without doing anything, if I take an endpoint DFT, what will I get? The signal is lying on a bin. I take an endpoint DFT. What do I get? I will get essentially two impulses. I will just show only one half. So, at m you will get an impulse. Okay, I will just show one half of the spectrum. Now, what we are doing to this, we are multiplying this with the hand window. So, I will call that signal as x hat of n. This is cos 2 pi m by n times n. This is multiplied by the hand window which is half into right. So, let us quickly multiply. Use your trigonometric identities. What do you get? So first I will get cos 2 pi m by n times n and then I will have product of these two cos signals. So product of cos, how do you decompose? Ah, it is half of cos a plus b plus cos a minus b. So we will have half of cos of a plus b which is uh, m plus 1. Similarly, I will have one more at m minus 1. Right? So, now we have basically three sinusoidal signals and all of them are indeed lying on a bin. Right? So, if I take the discrete Fourier transform now, I will again show one half of the spectrum where all I will have the impulse. Yeah, I will have 1 at m minus 1, 1 at m, 1 at m plus 1. Now, let us say in the original case, I normalize the strength of this impulse to be 1. So, here the mth bin, what will be the strength? Half, okay. m minus 1, 1 fourth, uh, and m plus 1 will also be 1 fourth. No, we will we'll come to that. Right? So, what happens is when you do this hand windowing, signal that was lying on a bin spills over to three bins in total one to the left and one to the right. Okay? So, we will have signal spillage to total of three bins. And again, I will show an example here. So, this is a case where signal is lying on a bin, so the signal is the same old this guy. I am taking 1024 point DFT. So, the yellow is the one when we do not do hand window. Blue is the case when we do windowing. Okay. And you can see that this is the peak, mth peak, 201th bin. The strength after doing the windowing is 6 dB lower. And these guys are also 6 dB lower from that. Okay. So, now, uh, I will take to the next page maybe. I had originally the signal like this. When I multiply by a smoothing function, I will do something like this going from 0 to 1. 
after windowing do you think the power in the signal has reduced increased or is it remaining the same right remaining the same i mean here you see that i am reducing the emphasis on the samples at the edges and retaining the strength of the samples around the middle so logically speaking do you think the power has increased or reduced it should have reduced okay it has indeed reduced so let's quickly compute what is the power so without doing any windowing this is the signal what is the power in this half 1 square by 2 what is the power in this guy we'll have three sinusoids one has an amplitude of half other two have one fourth so we can compute it it's half into square plus one fourth square okay so this can work out it's i think 38 so after doing windowing the overall power in the window signal is uh, reduced by a factor of 3 by 8 okay so now if you plot the adc's output spectrum and if you measure the signal lies on a bin you basically will have three impulses corresponding to the signal and all of the other things will be quantization noise so this is spv of klrsa now if i were to find the uh, signal power what should i do this is m m plus 1 to find the signal power what what should i do first first i'll have to add the sum of these guys okay and remember uh, i'll have to scale by n to get the power so this is summation from m minus 1 to m plus 1 and when we do windowing the power has reduced by a factor of 38 so what should i do to get the original power back okay <coughs> similarly for the quantization noise i'll basically sum up all of the other bins i'll just say other bins and again you'll have to do this by 8 by 3 I mean, for quantization noise, we have assumed that all bins have the same strength. Again, every bin after windowing will fall to either sides, <coughs> leak to either sides. So even after adding them, it will still be white, right? And again, to get the original power, you have to scale by a factor of eight. But once again, if you are interested only in the ratio of signal to noise power, these scaling factors don't make any difference. They simply get cancelled out. that's why loosely speaking in practice we just say that some of these three bins is the signal power and these give the noise power fine now the other effect of windowing is see now if your original input signal had see in this case uh, we had only one input signal which was of the form cos 2 pi m by n times n right now along with this let us say you had another signal which was at m plus 1 by n it is difficult for you to resolve from this because your original signal itself is spilling over to the next bin so along with that you also had a signal at m plus 1th bin it is very difficult to resolve that so that is what you kind of lose when you do this windowing okay you have to make sure that you have sufficient number of sample see so here you lose the ability to resolve signal which is located one bin to the left right so if you want to get back the same resolution you'll have to increase it the increase the number of points to 3n i mean basically one bin spills over to three bins so it makes sense that if i capture three times more then i'll be getting the same thing okay and the second is again uh, since you are signal bin is spilling to you know two bins to find the noise power you have basically two bins lesser to calculate right earlier to find the noise power i would have summed up all the other bins except the mth bin now in the noise calculation i am losing out two more bins right so these are minor issues with respect to uh, windowing 
Okay. Now, of course, along with, uh, I mean, besides hand window, there are lots of other windows. And one other window that we'll use in practice is Blackman Harris window. Again, uh, I'll not go into a lot of details. So, without windowing, if you find the FFT skirt is something like this. Now, with hand window, let us say it reduced like this. With Blackman Harris window, it will reduce further. Okay. And the uh, price you have to pay is the fact that with hand window, signals built to three bins, right? One to the left, one to the right. So with Blackman Harris, it will spill over to a total of seven bins. Okay. So I can show the window function. So the yellow one I am showing is the hand window. This is the window function. Okay. Uh, this is n. This is the amplitude. And the white one is the Blackman Harris, ironically. And you see that it reduces the FFT skirt by giving less weightage to more samples around the edges. Compared to hand window, the Blackman Harris gives lesser weightage to more samples to the edges and that's why it is sort of reducing the leakage. And uh, now after doing Blackman Harris window, do you think the power will be smaller than in hand window or higher? Smaller. Actually much smaller. Okay. <coughs> so again I can show some examples. So here again I am showing three cases. This is without any windowing. Yellow is hand. Okay, everything is gone. This is no window. This is hand. And white one is the black man has. I don't remember, you have to see. It is again a bunch of costs and stuff. So here I am showing a case where the signal is lying on a bin. So here I have chosen to be 201 by 1024N. So here I am showing that the signal spills over to three bins on either sides. That's all. Great. So the bottom line of the discussion is that as long as you are dealing with sinusoidal signals, it makes more sense for you to make sure the signal falls on a bin and in practice when you can't ensure that you resort to windowing and for that you will have to choose my input frequency fn to be of the form m by n times fs okay and n is the number of dft points that you want to capture so this is with respect to the signal let's also see what happens to the quantization noise uh, loosely so let us say i made sure that the signal falls on a bin So, which means if I take an n samples from 0 to n minus 1, I'll the signal will complete integer number of cycles. So, if I periodically repeat it on either sides, I'll have a, I'll have a smooth looking sinusoid like this. Now, if my input signal is periodic, what can you say about the quantization noise? Remember, this, this signal is getting quantized, right? For particular input amplitude, you get a particular quantized value. And if that input amplitude repeats after some time, what can you say about the quantization noise? That will also be periodic. Is that okay? Because it is just a one to one mapping from input to output. So if the input amplitude repeats, even the quantized value repeats, and the quantization error will also repeat. So even the quantization error, I will again uh, randomly draw something like this. Okay. So that will also be periodic. So you capture it for n samples and then if it is inherently assumed to be periodic by repeating it on either sides, you will have a smooth looking noise waveform, again loosely speaking, right? So you will have no issues. But uh, there is one class of ADC called noise shaping ADCs, we will look at later in our course. where even if your input signal is periodic, the quantization noise will not be periodic. Okay. So in that case, even if you make sure that the input falls on a bin, wherein, wherein, 
will come to that it has more features you look at it i'm just giving you a sneak peek so input is smooth like this but what will happen is quantization noise might not be so let's say it does something like this so now when you try to repeat it on either sides you'll have a sudden jump like this i mean this is not the quantization noise this is not how it will look like i'm giving a you know some crude picture that's all but because of the fact that the quantization noise will not be periodic even though you ensure that the signal falls on a bin for the quantization noise there will be abrupt jumps at the edges and that will result in a flat spectrum and that is uh, seriously problematic because in these noise shaping adcs the quantization noise spectrum will look like this it is hyper shaped okay. i mean the quantization noise itself has white psd but in the in those adcs you can think of it as the quantization noise is getting filtered by high pass filter so overall the quantization noise will have a notch at dc now if you don't do anything because of this jump we'll have a flat portion in the spectrum so we'll have something like this or i'll exaggerate and show it will have something like this so the overall spectrum will look like this you'll not be able to see the notch so again i'm showing an example here so the yellow one is a sinusoid input sinusoid so this is given to a noise shaping adc and i am directly capturing it for n samples and remember the signal is falling on a bin okay but because of the fact that the quantization noise is not periodic you have this flat portion in the spectrum or as ideally you should have gotten something like this so what is the solution now we have abrupt abrupt jumps in the quantization noise so what can you do i mean to smoothen the jumps what can you do no no we just saw right we like again window the signal okay but here we are doing the windowing not to smoothen the jumps in the signal but for the quantization noise and the moment you do that this is what you get the green one is with hand window you see that you get back the original spectrum and of course you can do a blackman harris window and the white one is blackman harris okay so the overall take away is that in simulations as long as you are not dealing with noise shaping adcs where the quantization noise is not periodic you make sure that your input frequency is lying on a bin like this and that is more than enough because in simulation you can make sure that this happens and the other thing is in simulation in simulators you don't round this value and give that is let us say your input frequency is this time some 10 megahertz you don't compute the fraction round it off to some three decimal points and give it that spoils the entire purpose so give it in a rational format like this and the simulator will compute this fraction to the fullest accuracy it has okay but in measurements of course you try to keep it like this but you cannot exactly guarantee it so we cannot exactly guarantee it so what do we have to do we have to do the windowing so you either do han or blackman harris but when you deal with noise shaping adcs where you have notches in the spectrum and the quantization noise is not periodic it is not enough if you just make sure the signal falls on a bin along with that you will have to do windowing this is just for the sake of quantization noise and of course in measurement you will again have to do a windowing and usually in measurement we prefer to use blackman harris because that smoothens out the i mean that reduces the fft leakage much better okay uh so kind of yeah so we think that we want the maximum number of cycles 
not maximum number of cycles, but at least there should be sufficient variations in the signal amplitude. Correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so that's what the BC signal. It's loose definition. It turns out if you make sure that all these thousand twenty-four samples are distinct and unique, it works. So it doesn't necessarily. I mean, you are uh, thinking BC signal to be a high frequency signal, right? I mean, lot of variations. In this case, all the thousand twenty-four samples. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Not necessarily. I mean, I can see you will have to test your ADC for multiple range of frequencies, right? I mean, this is basically a low frequency, 511 by 1024 times FS is close to FS by 2. So you will have to do it for whole range of frequencies. Again, the BC signal is a loose definition. In practice, you make sure that you will come to it now actually. Okay? So, great. So now, let's say you want to test your ADC, 10-bit uh, ADC. Let us say, what is the maximum sinusoidal SQNR you can get? 62 dB. So, for testing this, I'll have to make sure that my input frequency is m by n times fs. And first, I'll have to choose the number of points I'm taking for DFT. And that is again application dependent. So ideally you want a large n as possible because you are trying to measure the noise power by summing up lot of signal, I mean lot of FFT bins, right? Like with any statistical measure, more the number of samples you take for computing noise power, the better it is. Usually around 500 to 1000 is more than enough, but again it is all application dependent. So let us say for example, I choose this to be 8192. I think it's 2 power 13. Then I choose my m to be uh, 201. And I know fs, so from this I can find what fn is. Okay. And here I am showing what will be the spectrum here for a 10 bit ADC. So this is the number of points is 8192. This is the k axis going from 0 to 4095 or 4096, let us say. The y axis, what I am plotting is the pass spectral density scaled by n. Remember, if I uh, take the pass spectral density and scale by n, what do I get? Power. So now it directly gives me power in each bin. Okay. And as expected, I mean, uh, normalizing the signal amplitude to uh, minus 1 to plus 1. So the power should be minus 3 dB. That's what you get. And the quantization noise is roughly flat. So our assumption is reasonably fine. It has a wide pass spectral density. So from this we can do a quick uh, back of the hand calculation for SQNR. What is the signal power here? Let's say find. What is the signal power? Minus 3 dB. And for finding the noise power, what should I do? Well, essentially I have to add all of these guys. And approximately what is the value for all these guys? Yeah, no, no, it's not minus 100 into 4096. This is in dB scale. Okay. Summing, summation happens in absolute scale. Right? So, again, if you're not comfortable in dB, you can convert this to absolute. 10 power minus 10 is minus 100 dB. This times 4096. And then take 10 log of this. What do you think we'll get? Okay, I think I already did the calculation. So this is thing minus 63 dB or something. So what is my SQNR? 60 dB. And that's close enough to what you also expect. This is again a rough calculation so that you can quickly make sure if it's fine or not. Right? Okay. So till now we have assumed that along with the signal we only have quantization noise. But in practice we will also have uh, thermal noise electronic thermal noise which will also have a flat pass spectral density okay so along with your signal you'll have uh, uh, correct 
करेक्ट 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 टेन लॉक ऑफ माइनस टेन लॉक ऑफ हाफ राइट माइनस टी डी ओके सो इन प्रैक्टिस वील ऑल्सो हैव थर्मल नॉइस सो वील नॉट बी एबल टू जस्ट मेशर क्वांटाइजेशन नॉइस अलोन सो वॉट विल मेशर इज द टोटल सिग्नल टू नॉइस रेशियो विच विल बी दिग्नल पावर टू द क्वांटाइजेशन नॉइस पावर प्लस द थर्मल नॉइस पावर and in addition to thermal noise we'll also have nonlinearity because of the way we will be implementing these using transistors we look at it soon so the actual output will not be just the input plus the quantization noise plus thermal noise we'll also have nonlinear portions of the input say alpha 2 y square alpha 3 y cube and so on so in that case if i apply a sinusoidal signal to this non linear adc in the spectrum initially i ha i had only one impulse corresponding to the input and a flat portion corresponding to the quantization noise and thermal noise now what are the other components i'll observe if let us say this some f not second harm i mean second order non linearity will give rise to second harmonic and then third harmonic and so okay so we'll have to capture the effect of this non ideality in measuring the adc and that is done by using signal to noise and distortion ratio snd okay and this is basically the ratio of signal power to a uh, quantization noise thermal noise plus the distortion so this is signal to noise and distortion ratio so in practice when people just say it, uh, my snr is so much in the snr calculations we will not consider the distortion products okay. and of course sometimes this also called as si nad so signal to noise and distortion just put a b and becomes in bad Great. So, this SNDR is the absolute measure that captures all non-idealities in your ADC, right? So, when you are calculating the effective number of bits, we'll usually use this guy instead of just signal-to-noise ratio. So, it's SNDR minus one point seven six by six. so many bits. Okay. So now. let us say i take the adc 10 bit adc which we saw here i added uh, you know non linearity so i added a third order and a fifth order non linearity and this is the result i get so this is the signal lying at 201th bin third harmonic will lie in three times that 603 fifth harmonic is here okay and again n is 8192 so from this can you quickly tell me what is the SNDR, that is signal to noise and distortion ratio. Ah, signal power is minus three dB. Fine. And here I have to find noise plus distortion. I mean, see, you can do everything, but remember that this is minus fifty one, and my noise power was minus sixty. so the distortion is actually 10 times higher right so if it finally the sum will be dominated by what the distortion the third harmonic distortion so this this is 10 times higher right minus 50 db 60 db 10 db right 10 db is 10 times higher right is that clear so the distortion component is actually 10 times higher has a 10 times higher power Than the rest of your stuff, so SNDR is basically limited by this difference. And how much is that? It's around yeah minus forty eight dB. Sorry, forty eight dB. That's around eight bits. So although I had a ten bit ADC, <coughs> because of all these non-idealities, I have an effective ENOP 
of only 8 bits. Okay. So now if I uh, let's say keep increasing the input frequency, what will happen to the harmonics? They will also be going you know far apart and beyond some point what can happen is one of the harmonics say the fifth harmonic can go beyond this guy. So what will happen then? It will alias back. Okay. See remember that this is going from 0 to n by 2, discrete time is 0 to pi. If I had to map it in continuous time frequency, it is 0 to fs by 2. So any frequency which falls beyond fs by 2 will alias back. Okay. So here I am showing an example like that. Yeah. So the input is lying on 901th bin. Third harmonic is 3 times 901 here and remember my n is 8192 and the maximum is 4095, 96 let us say. The fifth harmonic will be 5 times 901 and that is 4505 and this is obviously greater than my half this one. So where will it alias back to? Okay, I will just show, I mean, see, if the signal is lying on 4, 5, 0, 5th bin, yeah, so it is, the discrete time frequency is 2 pi by 8192 and remember, I will also have a negative frequency component ideally. So this plus 2 pi is also the same frequency. So what do I get now? Yeah, so... So basically it will lie on this guy, 8192 minus 4505, okay. See the moment it goes back, it will either go to n minus something or 2 times n minus something and so on, is that okay? And that is this point, okay. And I mean if you keep increasing it further, what can happen is, one note will get stuck, let's close it. Okay. Okay, it's good. okay. So what can happen is the fifth harmonic can uh, alias back and it can fall between first and third harmonic also. Okay. And uh, this captures one such example. Yeah. Wherein this is the third harmonic. At a first glance this might uh, look non-intuitive because you expect that as you go to higher frequencies the strength should keep reducing. But here it is not the case, apparently not the case. That's simply because the fifth harmonic has alias back and fallen in between these two guys. Okay. Great. So now uh, one last point. Now let us say I take the same ADC which had an SNDR of 48 dB. So I choose my number of points for DFT as 3000 and I choose my input frequency to be cos 2 pi times 1000 by 3000 n in discrete time and I uh, give this as the input and see what the spectrum looks like. I look an absolutely amazing spectrum like this. Everything else is in you know this is 0 almost minus 150 dB is literally 0. So I basically see a DC term that you might think it is coming because of some DC offset in the circuit. I just have my signal at 1000th bin and no noise. So it looks like it is an amazing ADC but in fact it is not. It is the same guy which gave you an effective 8 bits. So what is happening? No, no, not that right. So what is happening here? If I simplify it what do I get? Okay. So we have how many unique samples? Only three unique samples, right? So it is a periodic signal with a period of three samples. So even if you have quantization noise, quantization noise will also be periodic with three samples. So if you have a periodic sequence with uh, three samples period, the fundamental frequency is 2 pi by 3. So we will have of course a DC term, fundamental and second harmonic. And remember if you have third harmonic it is same as 0. So you will have only 3 distinct frequencies. Okay. 
and even this 4 pi by 3 the same as 2 pi minus pi by 2 pi by 3 right so if you look at one half of the spectrum you'll basically see only two tones all your quantization noise all the signal harmonics everything will alias back onto these guys only okay and uh, remember 2 pi corresponds to n n is 3000 so it will lie on 1000th bin and this will lie on the 0th bin and that's what we got okay so it is not enough just to choose my input frequency to be of the form m by n times fs right here also it is the case i have chosen n to be 3000 and m is 1000 but that is not good enough yes so what is the condition then they should be co prime there should be no common factors in them so which means if i take a total of n samples all n samples must be unique there should be no repetition within those n samples right so the final conclusion is you choose fn to be m by n times fs where m and n are co prime okay so let's stop it yeah